Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to get started in just a minute. Just let people get settled in. But thank you for joining the Choice Solutions webinar with Automa. Uh, this is where you get to show off your dance moves for the audience. Yeah, if my audio stays good, then I'm good. All right, guys? <laughs> I don't have any dance moves, so stay tuned. Hmm. Okay, we gave everybody a couple more seconds to get settled in. Thank you again for joining us. Um, I'm Ellie with Choice Solutions. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Dana Stanlogi. Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Um, excited about the, the the next hour and the content and information and ideas that that our team has ready to share. So, um, very excited. A lot of this is kind of and and Shane and the team will kind of go through this more, but it's kind of inspired by an actual uh, customer challenge and situation. Uh, but through that, uh, you know, Scott and Shane and and Sam. I uh, thought there's just something valuable to, to share with others that might ignite uh, ideas for, for you and your team as well. So um, for those that aren't familiar with, with our team at Choice Solutions, I thought I'd give you just a, a real quick background on our team and family. That's, uh, that's our whole group kind of a little over a year ago when we got a chance to last be together again. Um, our main operations are in uh, Kansas City, but we serve clients throughout the central U.S. and the southeast. You might have seen the uh, the red shirts. So we are a little. Some of us are a little excited about the upcoming uh, Super Bowl this weekend. Go Chiefs! Um, but uh, yeah, serve. We've had the opportunity to assist 700 different companies across the uh, the U.S. across so many states, across a lot of different verticals as well. Uh, some fantastic customers you might see on here. But there's there's just <clears throat> there's so many great co companies that we've had the opportunity to be a partner and work with across, again, a lot of different verticals and, and industries. So we do appreciate you guys uh, taking time and being a part of it today. So um, a little bit about us, um, things that we really get inspired and, and passionate about getting engaged in is we know that uh, most of your organizations, you guys are obviously you work through a lot with COVID and enabling a, a remote workforce and work from home, but <clears throat> we've been providing solutions for businesses for years uh, around kind of improving the technology experience of your workforce. Um, and, and technology we know plays a, a big part in improving the employee experience. So whether it be VDI, the delivery of apps, desktops, you know, transition to DAS, all these things that uh, have in transition to the cloud, these are all things that have been uh, very much in motion uh, for you uh, and your businesses as you've as you've worked through solutions over the course of the past year uh, so definitely you know how you're how you're improving the user experience in, in your workplace but also to kind of you're also that major shift that we're all going through together right on that transition to transition to the cloud whether it be adoption of of SaaS applications, whether it be adoption of public cloud resources, or whether it be adopting uh, newer ways and more efficient ways uh, for on-prem type of resources. So kind of that transition from the old to the new and, and reasons for that. So our, our team, our company, our focus, um, really we're, we're here to help you adopt uh, hybrid cloud solutions. We want to enable your organization to have a simpler, more secure IT environment. Uh, from the data center or the cloud service all the way out to the endpoint. So that includes kind of, you know, simple cloud architectures um, and approaches, um, you know, secure digital workspaces. And then something today we're really going to talk in and, and feature a little bit more is on automated IT services and business process automation. Maybe it'll bring some new ideas uh, to life for you guys. Um, so some things we do, um, we can offer, you know, Obviously, we're a place where you can you can go buy buy stuff. Uh, we've got some very very innovative partnerships, Citrix, Automa, uh, one that we're some that we're featuring today. But a lot of industry leading partnerships, a very relevant kind of moving you know, forward thinking uh, technology companies and approaches uh, that we can be a place to you know obviously procure and partner through you know, those those services or those products. Uh, but we also what we really feature is we feature a fantastic professional services staff. So the know-how and the ability to kind of engage and really learn about what you're doing and helping you with that, you know, that blueprint or that, that forward thinking solution and how everything kind of comes together. We've got a fantastic professional services team that can kind of come in and help you get started with those, those things, as well as for organizations that are challenged on the operational upkeep. Uh, we've got a, a growing, a fast growing team that can help with various aspects of, of managed IT services for your organization as well. 
and then kind of I think you know some of the things that uh, you might find when you work through us and hopefully this is something you experience but one first and foremost it's the, the level of care that our team puts into to serving you as a customer uh, you matter you matter to us your success matters to us the investments you make through us uh, and your success with them they mean a great deal to us uh, also the the in-house expertise we have uh, we're gonna have a couple guys sharing today that are just flat out phenomenal uh, we've got a whole great team of people uh, that have those kind of capabilities too but obviously scott osborne and shane kleiner a couple of ctps on our staff uh renowned experts in the euc space um that uh, that are going to be sharing some some insights and some wisdom and some great ideas that they've they've come across and thought might bring value to to you guys as as uh, customers and, and as an organization as well. So uh, without taking any more time of theirs, I'd love to introduce you to uh, Shane Kleiner, Scott Osborne, and then they'll be also introducing Sam from Automa. So thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, Shane, are you taking that? Yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, you know, a uh, one-on-one mistake there on mute. I was just trying to show the audience what not to do. You figure after, uh, what, 10 months? 12 months of being in this situation, I know how to hit the unmute button. So we're starting great. So yeah, so I'm Shane Kleiner, the guy that un didn't hit the unmute button. Dana, thank you for that awesome introduction. Really set the stage for today. Uh, so I'm a senior solutions architect uh, for Choice Solutions, uh, obviously. I am regionally for the Southeast, excited to be here today, uh, specializing in end user computing. And um, uh, Scott Osborne, go ahead. Or yeah, Ozzie, man. Ozzie. So, so you know, uh, AKA Scott Osborne. So, you know, let's just be real, but pretty much everything's, uh, everything Shane just said, except for uh, North Central Regional League for Choice Solutions. So I'm just glad to be on here. Uh, really, I'm kind of second fiddle on this one, to be honest. Sam and Shane are bringing all the value, talking about the cool value added stuff, creative solution here that they came up with that really uh, launched this and took this to Citrix. Uh, so, you know, Citrix, the whole pause resume capability. Uh, this was really coming from this creative idea, this uh, customer situation rather than vice versa where the, where we have it now in the product because of these guys. So anyway, yeah, just glad to be on, but uh, really just for the lab build and uh, helping the uh, color commentary. <laughs> Now, I also got some awesome stuff to share with uh, some of the customers, too, that we, uh, we kind of yeah. picked up on the load testing stuff. And we're excited to introduce uh, Sam Benio, which we've known for a few years now. Uh, we're excited about uh, automated technology, what it brings to the table, what it brings to our portfolio and our customers. Uh, Sam's been doing a lot with, uh, you might have seen the, the name out there with the CGC. He's done a lot of great stuff with the community. He's the CTO for Automate. Uh, so, Sam, again, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for putting this together. I appreciate awesome. it. All right, let's rock and roll. So yeah, we got a lot of good stuff for you today. Uh, so let's start off with uh, what we're going to hit. We're going to do an introduction to automated partnerships, a little bit about what we talked about. We'll expand on that, and, and, and Sam will give you a nice overview of what uh, automate brings to the table and what we bring together. We'll talk about what Oz mentioned, which is you know how do we turn that creative idea that we had into a reality? How do we leverage the robotic automation platform that automate provides to take that idea that we had and really introduce automated uh, pause and resume uh, technology there in session recording. Little intro to session recording 2012, uh, nothing crazy there. It's not entirely focused on session recording. Um, we'll, we'll do a demo of the ISR Nanobot, because uh, I think that's really cool just to kind of see it live and see how we actually you know, took that idea and created it. Um, and then we'll, that will kind of segue us into Scenario Builder, which is how you build those actual custom automated workflows how it's all done in kind of a no code, you know, low code, really no code. I mean, it's literally drag and drop and just kind of think through the process. There's a recorder. Sam's going to show all that cool stuff. And then we'll highlight uh, Automate App Loader and how we're using it to extend uh, and how we extend that to our customers for from a load testing perspective. So, Sam, let's go ahead and I guess take it away and, and tell us a little bit about Automate's platform. Well, so our, our goal is to offer our customers, uh, let me make sure that, okay, I'm not on mute. Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh man, that was a cat blow it about, man. Blow it about. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was really serious. So, it's a robotic automation platform that we offer our customers is to make sure that they can uh, run performance tests before they go to production, run load tests from all their strategic locations, and make sure that before they, they deploy the application to production, that their users can. Uh, the application will perform as it should from all their strategic uh, locations. Also, with the same 
the same uh, token, they, they can run functional testing, and this is all robotic uh, functional testing where it's data-driven testing with one business process, for instance, that's what this, uh, this one is showing. You can, you can check if uh, the students we were talking before with, uh, with Scott about uh, universities now adopting uh, WVD or, or Citrix, uh, Citrix Cloud, uh, how you can, you can run the tests and, and make sure that all your business processes are running as they should before you, you, do, you do the upgrade, you finish the upgrade or, or you deploy to, to live system. Then when the application moves to production, you can continuously monitor, have robots going through the business process and not just launching the application, just the, the desktop, but actually launching the application inside the desktop and go through the whole process, making sure that your end users can go through those processes and that the, that the performance is acceptable. If it's not, you get we trigger alerts or we, uh, and we can send them to other the third party systems or just our system that can trigger alerts and, uh, and let you know when it's happening and, and why as well. And the lastly, robotic process automation, that would allow you to eliminate repetitive tasks, whether your end users or your system architects, or uh, it, it doesn't matter in what system, we can automate all those, uh, all those processes because it's all done from the front end. Yeah, and I, I think what's, what's cool about that, Sam, is when we kind of got introduced a couple of years ago is, you know, Automate was originally founded, right? And I think it was early 2000s, right? I mean, you've been around as a robotic automation platform and, and you know, rebranded and such, but uh, you were doing RPA before RPA was even a thing, right? And, and that's what's kind of cool about, uh, about how that, that, you know, it's not just, it's just, this isn't just a new technology that was developed, uh, you know, a year ago. So it's got a lot of time and uh, built into the platform, so. Well, we, yeah, we started RPA since 2000, uh, 2005, actually, our first performance the testing tool uploader was RPA based and it's still today. And uh, yeah, like like you were saying, it's, it was before RPA became became RPA today. And and one of the things that are the, the strength and what we're trying to offer our customers and our partners is that with that our automation platform will allow you to use the same automation, same script, whether you want to do load testing or you want to do functional testing, application monitoring, and robotic process automation. So it's it is it can follow through all your your use cases, and and that that in turn will help you save on training and implementation cost. And also one of the the most challenging things in in automation is creating best practices and and make sure that everybody is using automation the same way, and you don't have different departments doing different things using different tools. That That's the goal. Awesome, yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. And we're gonna kind of talk about how we can kind of co-add and, and how we collaborate uh, and, and drive some of these value add services. I mean, the first one that, that uh, Oz and I kind of, <clears throat> Oz and I kind of put together was really, you know, from the CVAD perspective, we started realizing as we're, as we're doing our deployments, you know, you know, it's been a few years now, right, since Microsoft has been on that continuous release path, Citrix is on that continuous path, and obviously a lot of the applications are, have been going that way as well. It, it used to be, was, you know, it was nice to have kind of a continuous automation kind of testing platform. Now it's almost a need to have, right? And, and we, we started realizing that as, you know, so we've been adding into our deployments, we've been adding uh, load and performance testing through our partnership. We have, you know, 100 licenses we're able to use with, with our customers for a duration of a week. Um, just some services obviously added on for that, but that allows the customer to get an experience of what we're actually doing. We can use that tool to actually conduct that load test of that newly built environment, uh, you know, for that for the for the customer to actually test all these different infrastructure, architecture, and components that lead up to that actual design. So that's a, that's been a really nice thing that we did. Obviously, continuous end user monitoring, as he mentioned, but it, the big thing here is it's not just app and desktop. A lot of the solutions out there today won't name a bunch of solutions, but they do kind of like to think of Citrix app probing, right? They take you to the actual application or the desktop launch, and then it stops at that point, really. Right? Like, this is about designing end user workflows. So what is the business process that user is doing to launch that desktop and then conduct those end user workflows that they do every day? And if those fail, we know the business process failed. Crap, it's the fan. Let's go send that alert, take a screenshot and send it off to the team. Obviously, you still have your other solutions to do like, you know, vent log scraping or service monitoring, but this is about the business process. But data-driven functional testing, we talked through that, and, and RPA is something that we really team with, with Automate for, 
Um, that's something that, you know, they have uh, services driven around that. We have business process folks on, on staff as well. But it's important to mention that it's not equal to, to Citrix micro apps, which is part of that intelligence workspace. Uh, and the big piece there is, I mean, robotic process automation is you're automating a process essentially and replacing whatever that process was that that person did. And then those people can then be freed up and do other things. Uh, and there's a lot of different definitions of that. But micro apps is about you know, if, if that one application, if you had a user that had to go into four or five different applications, we're going to slim that down to a micro app that's kind of custom designed through Citrix. And they still have an app, that user is still performing that actual workflow. So it's a little bit different, but still similar around the business process automation piece. So a little bit of a backstory, we won't spend too much time on this, but this is really where that creative idea happened and how we kind of got into this uh, situation, which is really cool is um, we had a customer, it was a, a you know, large uh, a customer, they're, they're an airline, there is PCI environment. Um, they were using a different solution than Citrix. They're using Calabrio uh, for call recording. Um, it had some built-in kind of functionality to kind of block uh, sensitive screens and things like that, but it wasn't really, it, it required kind of custom development uh, for this type of application. It was a native application that the customer had. Uh, so what we needed to do is we needed a way to, they're already a, an automated customer at the time, uh, and then we needed a way to basically come in and say, you know, what we're really looking for is those payment fields. When they're making a reservation, we want to look at that payment field. When we find that, we want to issue the API command to pause the recording. When that screen goes away and they move off to something else, we want to resume the recording. And that that really worked really well. So, um, you know, we talked to, we talked to, to, to Sam and we kind of talked over the solution. And they basically, that's kind of how... Um, we were able to leverage that nanobot technology. So there were 600 users, uh, and for this one use case specifically for as a call center, uh, they were able to use the nanobot for a pause and resume functionality and future state because it's a robotic engine that's in there for the visualization. It's actually looking at you know images on the screen. It's looking at text on the screen through OCR. They're actually looking at possibly taking um, you know the the reservation IDs that they're actually in, grab that, you know, read that, and then send that through an API command. So when they look at the recording from a QA perspective, oh, well, here's the actual reservation. That's something they're looking at. So um, you know, then we took all that, we kind of packaged it up, and we said, hey, you know what? You know, this is this is really cool stuff. You know, why don't we look at Citrix session recording? So we, we dove in there, and Citrix session recording, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Had had stop and start, and, and there's some challenges with that. Uh, we were able to talk to Citrix, you know, through our relationship as as part of the CCP program and, and directly related, uh, you know, uh, working with the product managers, we were able to kind of get on the get get on the call and, and talk through. We, we introduced them to Automate and said, hey, look, here's what we did with another co uh, company. Are you willing to do the same kind of build into that product? And and, and they were, they thought it was a great idea. And actually, it took, a, a, I think it was like three, three months or so, or maybe a little bit longer, but they were actually 2012 release that came out. So really cool stuff to see that. Uh, so we were able to take that kind of creative idea to do automated pause resume and, and bring it to life, and we'll talk through that. So we'll pause for a second and talk about Citrix session recording. If you do have questions while we're talking here, drop them into the little uh, question deal, and we can kind of address them as as we hit, you know, as, as we go through stuff. So really, if you haven't used Citrix session recording, to me, it's one of the most underused products that Citrix owns. They've owned it since the Smart Auditor days. For anyone that remembers that, or remember Ed site for load testing, right? They used to have a product for load testing. Yes. It's there somewhere in a corner somewhere, but. Um, it, it you know records both applications and desktop sessions, right? And and it, there's a lot of use cases for that. Um, and the big thing is it's you know CVAD premium. If you're CVAD premium or or workspace premium or above, you actually have this technology. So really, you know, we're happy to talk to you a little bit more about it, how you can get it into your environment. Some folks are a little bit nervous about doing it because they said, well, what about sensitive data? And how does that? What happens if that goes into my recording? And we're happy to report now that we can help with that with this new intelligent pause and resume using the event APIs. Session recording basically has, uh, there's an SMB store or a local store for kind of the actual recordings. You have a backend database, some policies associated with that for the new kind of event-based triggers and things you can do for you know different environments like PCI, non-PCI, remote contract workers, and when you trigger recordings and all this cool stuff. And you have a session recording server that could be kind of load balanced. Again, this is more high level. We wanna get into really about what we can do with the automation platform. If you you know if you're in an environment where you want to just think about user support right you want to record all the user sessions and, and that the user calls up it's always like your word versus the user's word right um, and of course the user's always right but you know trust but verify well now you can actually verify with the recording forensics uh, user user monitoring as well um, you know capture malicious behavior they do they've had start and stop so you can trigger a start and stop based on you know a malicious event uh, which is kind of cool and then you know a lot of we see this a lot in like healthcare and, and financial customers as well. So session recording is, you know, some of the security focused features, right? So we talked about, we worked with Citrix for pause and resume. Uh, prior to the 2012 release, again, it was only stop and start. We, we introduced the pause and resume functionality, which we, again, really excited about there. But it's also great for if you want to do event-based triggers. So 
uh, you know, it's it, over the last like year, year, two years, they started adding these event triggers where, you know, USB events, uh, file changes, uh, you know, different browsing or websites or processes, you can actually create policies to trigger recordings based on those things, which is pretty powerful. And again, if you, a lot of people own this, they never even touch it. It's just sitting there on that shelf, right? Um, but now you can actually get, get use it. And, and most recently they integrated with security analytics. So the challenge with all that, with the, the challenge with pause and uh, with start and stop is you ended up with this, right? If a user is taking a reservation and you had to stop and start it, you know, a hundred different times during a session, you got a hundred different recordings for that one user. And from a usability standpoint, it, it kind of sucks, right? So what we're able to do with the pause and resume is you have a single session. This is what it looked like before. You would have this recording, but when it's in there, you have you know, social security number, which is not good, right? You're gonna get, you're gonna get your hand slapped from a compliance standpoint. So what we introduce is part of the APIs that Citrix now has. Again, the third-party integration. It, it's something that you know, if you if you're if you can do automation, you can you can do this. We, we're taking advantage of the automation engine from Automate to look at the visual aspect, right? But if you want, you can just take a PowerShell script and pause and resume. But it's it's nice to have that visual representation to know when it's okay. These are variable based. So you can put whatever you want there when the content actually gets blocked. It's, it works for the web player as well. And now with security analytics integration, you can actually see. Again, that, that's an add-on service through, through Citrix, but you can actually see session recording events. And because all this data is logged through the API, when you actually go to security analytics, for, for whatever the reason is that you're pausing, whether it's you know credit card or social security number, or whatever that may be, you can actually, that data is now tracked in security analytics from a historical perspective, which is, which is really cool. A QR code will actually take you to the setup page. If you do own it, you already have it set up, you want to test just using native functionality for pause and resume, that's how you do it. Obviously, it's nice to have the, the nanobot because now you have visual representation. Uh, with that said, let's talk about the solution, right? So we we, we kind of this was basically packaged up, and it's the the automated intelligent session recording nanobot. If you if you go to a QR code there, um, that will actually take you to uh, the automated website that kind of gives you an overview of all this good stuff about it. Uh, but the idea is it's automated pause and resume, as we mentioned. It's plug and play. It's very very easy to set up, and we'll we'll show you that when you see the power of the scenario builder. Um, it, it's just a matter of taking some images of, of of the screens that are considered sensitive. And now that the bot is continuously running in the background, looking for those things, if it finds that it, it triggers the API. And it, at that point, it basically will issue a pause or resume. So it's very plug and play based. Uh, from a sensitive data, and there, it was really driven around data compliance uh, because of this reason. We talked to a really large insurance organization, uh, Oz and I recently, in a, with a customer. They had some challenges, like they, they there are a few thousand seats they have session recording, but they had to scale down their QA to in forensics department because they had sensitive stuff in the recordings. Well, now with pause and resume functionality, right? Now we can actually identify those fields and now you can actually scale up that QA team because you don't have to worry about that sensitive data actually being in the recordings. I think it's a really cool use case. Uh, with that said, some other insights around just the nanobot in general is, uh, you know, this is kind of a, a highlight of what Scenario Builder looks like, but Sam's gonna kind of walk you through that and, and you'll see why, how it's drag and drop and all that cool stuff. But it's it's an autonomous RPA bot. It's what RPA does, but it's just, you know, autonomous, it runs inside of your VDA. So the licensing actually, which this was cool, uh, you know, uh, Sam let us know as well, is it's not just session recording. So inside of the VDA, you can have one script that's doing the session recording, but let's say there's some other uh, application that's kind of Mickey Mouse or for whatever reason you need to do some visual automation, right? We call it because this is like, think of it like a visual automation assistant. If you're doing traditional automation, you're doing scripts and stuff like that, PowerShell, whatever, to get that visual piece, you know, unless you're doing like looking at window IDs and class ID, it's hard to get that visual of like, let's look at like the picture on the screen, right? So that's what, think of this as an assistant that can work in conjunction with what, whatever automation that you have on that platform. It just it requires an SMB to share it up, share, uh, sorry, an SMB uh, share to set up. That's where your shared scenario will be stored. Um, it directly integrates with Scenario Builder. So all you need is Scenario Builder. You, you go in and set up the path and uh, and you go and create your script and you just click send to scenario and you, the bot, the, there's basically a nanobot agent that goes into your VDA and you're ready to rock and roll. So really to sum it up, it's really, uh, they'll see something, do something, right? It, if it sees it, let's go ahead and automate it. So, with that said, that's enough of the PowerPoint. That's the last of the PowerPoint here. Let's get into uh, to seeing some demos. Um, all right, so we'll go ahead and uh, and uh, and log in. So we're basically just a little bit on the demo environment. So we're running everything. Uh, I logged me out here, but running everything on our. Uh, let me log in when it's doing that. I'll click over. So we're we're doing everything on our. Um, you know, Nutanix. So we got Nutanix in the lab. Everything's kind of set up on our Nutanix platform here. Um, so let's log in. 
everything's running as a CVAD environment, so everything's running as a CVAD, a CVAD service. Um, yep, we'll go ahead and launch our Windows. So Windows 10 desktop, nothing, nothing crazy, nothing you know, super fancy. It's just about really showing this functionality. Uh, okay, so let that kind of kick off. Uh, so what we're going to do is now we're session recording 2012. I just want to mention that while I was kicking off, just just yeah. to give Shane a chance to breathe real quick. Oh, thank you. Um, I had to take a. Yeah. I just wanted to say, you know, going back a few slides, don't have to go back, but just to talk to that a little bit, it, this use case for me was pretty spectacular when I think about it, because really it's a prime example of how technology integrators, uh, partners coming together to uh, really, you know, provide a solution for a, for a business in need, right? So you mentioned the Calabrio uh, software they were using before that wasn't they couldn't do this, right? They they had something critical they had to address right away, and really the flexibility of Sam to jump on with us and, and then and then talk to Citrix about getting this in the product, you know, having that all come together, uh, that that vision and that idea, and then come together and then boom, it's in the product in 2012. Uh, for me, that whole story is just uh, it's fantastic. So, you know, kudos to 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 you guys on, on bringing that together and Sam for your team for developing the nanobot and really, uh, you know, helping customers uh, drive this solution to have this available to them now as part of your suite. It's pretty amazing. So. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. And uh, that's awesome. Gotcha. Yeah. No, yeah. I was going to say, no, I, I totally agree. I think that's really, really awesome. And, and uh, I agree. It's been, been awesome to work together on it and we're excited to, uh, to bring it, bring it forward to, to customers. Yeah, so so we basically uh, so so this is in kind of debug mode, just so you can kind of see it's just kind of looping in the background, looking for what we had to find in the script. So the users, you know, in here, they're uh, they're basically in the up. Oh, they're looking at GameStop. Looks like it dropped down again. They were trying to do that squeeze on uh, Wall Street bets, uh, you know. Uh, so they're in here in messages. That's all being recorded over here to the left. But let's go ahead and uh, we go in here and, and look to add a um, you know add some patient data. Right. What you can see here is uh, as soon as I went and put the, set, the social security as I'm going to put that information in here. Actually, I'm not going to put my real social security number. That, that would <laughs> kill the whole point of what we're doing. So, <laughs> so you can see the uh, the automated the automated engine. You can see it. What it did is it issued the API command. You can see it it triggers as an event here. Uh, open EMR. So there's two arguments. If you look at the documentation, it's app and reason code. So we're sending the app is open EMR. The reason code is you know social security number field detected. Recording pause until social security number is no longer available. So if I go back to my message center, for instance, you'll see it takes, this is live, so it takes about a second, right? Because we're in live view. But you can see it automatically spits it out. We're back in the game, right? We're going in here, going to go to my different apps, right? And maybe I'll go in and, you know, let's go ahead and add, actually add, a, we'll go look at, you know, patient data here, right? Now it detects oh, social security never found again, right? Because it's looking specifically for some images here and it knows, hey, there's social security field. Let's go ahead and pause the recording. It's it's really just as simple as that. Like it's you know I can go ahead and all day kind of click. I can click the calendar and it's just going to go click back. It's it's you know pretty pretty real time, right? It, because it detects that those fields um, are there and it's going to go ahead and pause the recording. All these triggers are once it's logged, it's logged in the database, so that stuff can be like I said triggered or, or searched on down the road. So you can you can go ahead and with with the bot and we'll look at what the code looks. It's not even code. We'll show you the scenario what it looks like. You can just go ahead and and with the script you can actually say hey you know this is a a credit card number or it's a reservation or whatever you want to say it'll say content blocked and it'll be whatever you want uh, so that's kind of cool from an auditing compliance perspective so to kind of show uh you know again this is this is what it looks like right uh, when it's actually running it, that's just a debug it's in the logs that, that won't actually be there when you actually log in in a non-persistent environment it runs in the background you won't even it's not obviously showing a, a black console window right um so inside of the scenario builder this is what kind of the script looks like uh, Sam is going to walk through what all the different functions are, but you can actually easily name everything here. Um, but basically, we're just looping, right? We created a loop, and we're looking for specific uh, images for the social security number field. If we do find that, let's go. It's nested under here. Let's go ahead and run a PowerShell command. We just took the basically you import a module and then you run a command. We just threw that into a PowerShell script, so it's just easy to kick off. We'll write it to the event log so people know, and you can scrape that if you're using Splunk or whatever you want. We'll go ahead and set a variable, and then as it loops back, it just waits for that image to disappear. When it disappears, it runs the resume command, writes to it, writes the variable, and it just loops. Super simple. So um, that's that's all that's all that's uh, you know that's kind of all that's uh, there from a script perspective. And then what you actually have uh, when you look at how it ties in, 
over here, you have what's called a base station. We just have a, um, a path. It's called a nanobot. You put the SMB share. Um, if you go look just real quick on that SMB share, you know, all you're going to have uh, basically is, um, what's this for? It's an OP lab. Shane, you can, can you make it a little bit bigger, not in split screen, so we can see what you're showing more in detail? Oh, yeah, than... yeah, you got it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. For some of us that... The, the, that better? the glasses are not working very well. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah, it's just yeah. big monitors, man. You know. Yeah, and he was he was just showing the other screen oh, just to kind of show you the live view, which you don't need yes. to see at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Oh. Sam, let me get that. Let me zoom in for you a little bit. There you go. All right. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is the SMB share, right? It's just a, it's just a zip file, right? And if you look at the contents of that, it's just a scenario. It's just images and an XML file, right? And it'll grab that, run it in RAM, and just kind of rock and roll on it. Uh, so that's that's really it. I mean, when you go ahead and um, you know, when you're done and you, you go ahead and hit send scenario, once you make your changes, it sends it out to the share, and you just uh, the bot's ready to go with the new any kind of changes that you need to make. So, so with that said, I guess I'll I'll pause for a second. You know, are there any questions? Again, I'm just this was kind of showing the the session recording functionality once again, and we're showing um, you know how it how it works in automated fashion. You know, with automate and how that stuff was was paused, how the nanobot works. Um, but if you have any yeah. questions on that or session recording, we're happy to answer them. Yeah, just real quick from my standpoint, uh, you know, for me, uh, Shane touches on how it's it's sim simple, right? But uh, it really it's an attestment also to Automate has been doing in the game a long time for image recognition and yeah, recognizing exactly. those fields. Yeah. I mean, it's simple to to a point of how he created the bot and how it works and how you can develop the scenario builder and 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 do that. But at the same time, the product and within there, you know, you got uh, decades of uh, you know technology behind the scenes uh, able to do this right so Sam can probably talk to that all day long if we wanted to but, yeah. Uh, yeah absolutely uh, one thing that I want to add is that because of the fact continuing to what uh, Shane and Scott are saying because we've been doing this for a long time and because we started with performance testing those bots that are running in the background that even if they're looking at the whole desktop they're not using a lot of resources. Obviously, you don't want the bot to be using uh, more resources than your application. They're using less than 1% uh, of the resources and, and they're very, very efficient on looking for small images, whether all over the desktop or in just in active windows or application windows and, and multi-monitor environment and, and all that stuff. So it's uh, all those things are covered with, the, with those simple scripts. But uh, yeah, yeah, they're they're pretty powerful. Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up, and that, I mm -hmm. think that's a great point. Is really they they automate really doubled down on the image recognition te uh, technology. It's it's with with you know automated it, it, with tolerance and and uh, the OCR detection, all these different things that are in it that really makes it uh, simple. So yeah, with that said, and just the last thing to show here is uh, it, it all works within the web player as well. The web player is a little bit more modern. You can see your pause events are actually triggered here, and you can kind of see those, which is kind of cool. So it works in both the web and native player uh, for Citrix since uh, CVADA 2012. So, so that's it on on the nano. But I want to take the rest of the time to pass it off to Sam and, and kind of talk through uh, talk through App Loader, and uh, and really to start with Scenario Builder, right? It's, you know how it was easy for us to build this script. Let's talk about that robotic engine and how it all kind of comes together. So let me pass this off to uh, to Sam here. Okay. Thank you, Presenter. <laughs> Bada bing, here we go. Boom. Okay, show main screen main screen. So here it is. You see it? We're all good? Yes, sir. Okay, so let me see here. Let me expand my window. All right. So yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Shane and, and Scott. That was a really good uh, good presentation. I'm gonna just, just continue here and show how easy it is to create a script and talk a little bit about our logic and automation and what how it's done. And uh, actually just show you uh, how easy it is to create a more complicated script that's gonna launch uh, a Citrix desktop and then go to Salesforce and see what was recorded, how easy it is, hopefully less than five minutes to do it and, and then show you uh, a load test from that. So let's just uh, do, uh, obviously, uh, let's do demo today is 2-3-2021. Uh, you can have, you can reuse most of your, your script just uh, at the project level 
or share scripts between between different different other automations and and, and make it simpler so here I, it says do you want to open web application or start from the command line or even create it one step at a time manually uh, it doesn't really matter because it's all the same the for instance open web application will just launch a browser ask you for a browser and url and then starts recording the same way because our bots are looking at the application the same way the end user is looking at, at them not they don't know that it's a citrix session or it's web application it's all it's all transparent to it it's all from the front end so if i i start recording we see the recorder here we can add variables we can add transactions and things like that but as I am going through the application. It is actually analyzing what's happening on the on the desktop, and I will try to talk and do multiple things at once. Yeah, I mean, while you're typing that in, I think one of the cool things that you know, Oz and I have been talking about is uh, is it's an agnostic because it's from the end user perspective, like you said. So it's something that we've we've been talking to customers about. When we're talking about you know Windows Virtual Desktop or Citrix doesn't really matter, right? And and that's something that we were having come up a lot. Uh, with customers when they're talking about Windows 10 multi-session and how to size for that on Azure, for instance, and this is where real this is where you know testing your real workloads uh, make a lot of sense to, when you're talking about sizing this stuff, saving on cost. So. Thank you, uh, and and that did help a lot. Yes, because uh, remembering my password and doing all these things at the same time can be challenging. It's not easy. Sometimes. It's kind of like you know forgetting <laughs> we're, on mute. We're here to help you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Got you. Got you. <laughs> so S Sam's a big dog. He he does these live every single time. So there's no talking yeah. to a recording with Sam. So I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Well, but I have good help, guys. You have the right are you dot IO? Is that right for your email? Okay, cool. Oh yeah, this is just a test environment, that's why. And so obviously everything I I typed is can be uh, stored in variables or or from a csv file it's not always you're going to have the same username and password obviously especially if you're doing a load test uh, you you're, you're going to simulate multiple users and you can do that for from 50 to 50,000 users at uh, any given time that's not a problem it actually scales pretty easily now i'm just going to add a lead quickly and these also can come from uh, a csv file or from database and that's it. Be done. It's all being recorded, right? Oh, of course, yes, yes. And then save it. Now it's saved correctly. Just make sure that it's saved correctly here. And then I'll just log out and close the browser. Close my my session here. Disconnect. And that's it. Will be done. To look at what was recorded, which actually you can see as it's being recorded. I just I just wanted to remove the, the distraction away so as i was going through the script like i said it's looking at images and actually even analyzing seeing that i clicked on log off button it doesn't really know that it's a button but it takes image with mouse over without mouse over and then you see every every uh, images here have a child of mouse move and click and you see the coordinates are zero zero that means that it's going to click in the middle of this uh, this image no matter where it is you see the position of the anchor is the center you can you can adjust that and it has every action has a, a set of properties you can for instance uh, tell it to, to look for it in black and white and you just come here and change the contrast and it recommends 67 percent so if i go to 67 percent it's it's literally black and white and that's what it's recommended now it's only using this uh, black and white if if this is set and what it does you see the image is not has not changed it's just adjusting the buffer of the image and they would uh, they would adjust the, the desktop as well and then look for it in on a black and white screen so you see here it, it took three different uh, variation of the same image and so on and as the, the things that, that would make more sense, for instance, as I was going through Salesforce, even though I clicked directly on the field, it knew that the label was on the top of the field, on, uh, above the field, and it, so it looks for, this is just a fallback. If you cannot find the image, if the fonts change, if anything changed, it knows that it's a, it's a username, so you can use OCR to find it. And like you say, I, I was saying before, it goes below it, and and click on it to enter username and password 
it's it's pretty s simple, pretty straightforward. Here, it recorded the password in in clear. Of course, you can encrypt it, and once you do that, you can never decrypt it. Uh, even if I click here on decrypt, it's still going to stay the same. You can click again, and even the data for the for the test in the CSV file, you can encrypt the whole CSV file so that uh, nobody can can have access to it and it with the high level of encryption. So, like I was saying, this is all straightforward uh, mouse move and click, like uh, that's what the recorder does and usually gets you there at 95, 96% accuracy. Afterwards, you can, if you want to, if you forgot anything during the recording, you can add, for instance, transactions. And that's as simple as here saying, okay, when I click on the log on button, for instance, this is how long it takes to log in to Citrix, for instance, just add here. I could have done it during the recording, but of course I forgot. I could not do multiple <laughs> things at the same time. So I do, you just add here, log into Citrix, and I just move it below. That means from the time after I click on this button until I see my desktop's icon, that that's what, that's going to be my my uh, login time. You can divide the complexity of the script into multiple components, like log into the application, find the patient, subscribe medication, and discharge patients. Instead of putting them all in in a big script, you can create components that that will include what I exactly said. Uh, you can run PowerShell, you can run batch files, you, you can call uh, API, make API calls to other applications. Uh, like I was saying before, you can uh, also call other scripts that that will execute a login, for instance, to Citrix all the time. You can find text in, in an image, like uh, drop-down fields uh, inside Citrix. If you cannot really read what's what's in the fields, we can use OCR on that. Uh, you can manipulate, uh, write, and read to Excel files. But more importantly, you can add any business logic to your business process. You can add, even though it's not a programming language, you can add an if condition loops, which is read text into a variable, read from XML file. Uh, we even have integration with the, back, the storefront with, with Citrix where you can use, well, you can use for each application or each item in, in Citrix and, and, and so on. And more important also, you have what we call on failure, which is always executed. It, it actually will take, uh, it will be added at the, at the bottom of the script or a component. And if the script fails anywhere in uh, any any problem in, in scripts, it's going to skip to the failure section. And then there, it can be as simple as just closing the application. So the next time the script executes, is, uh, uh, it has a clean desktop or uh, you can actually try to recover from that failure. Maybe there's a pop-up window that showed up, like saying the, the system will go in maintenance mode this next uh, next Friday or next month or whatever, and the, the bot will acknowledge it like a user would and resume to go back, go back to where the failure happened and continue from there. So you don't have any false positives or, or anything. Uh, so once you write the, you create the script, you can play it back. I'll just play it quickly. I don't know if we have to go through the whole thing, or or not. It's just it's gonna go through what I what I did and and uh, launch it. And you see at the bottom right here, it tells you what it's doing, what it's expecting, and how what what data it's uh, it's entering and how it's interacting with desktop. And once it's it's done with that you can save the script and send it to the controller and then you can either use it for nanobot like we were talking about before or you can use it to run a, a load test or functional test or or continuous monitoring with with the same process that we were looking at and you see here it's waiting for salesforce icon for 31 seconds until it shows up and when it shows up it's going to go and click on it and continue so it, we also give the the timeout. How long is it going to wait for certain images until it decides that uh, it's no longer it's not acceptable to wait for it anymore? And that's uh, that's when it would fail. If that's the case, it will actually the robot will take a, a screenshot of the desktop and then send it to you. Either track it during the load test. That's not uh, it. It will tell you for each one that failed where it failed and why what the bot was expecting to happen on the desktop before uh, before continuing to next step or uh, or like i said it would send it in an email to 
to uh, to the person that that should receive that email or or send it to another another software like Splunk or or other softwares out, out there or AppDynamics or whatever you you're using for your monitoring or uh, uh, service now, for instance, as well. Yeah, I think that was. Uh, I think that's one of the cool things uh, from a troubleshooting standpoint. Is it's funny because uh, it had this had, had this failed. You could have kind of showed showed a little bit of the uh, you know when it fails and what the on failure screenshot looks like, um, which looks like well, oh maybe the last thing yes, I have to be able to do it now. Perfect. You had to mention it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and that's <laughs> no, no. That's good. That's what we want. See, it goes to on failure now. While well, I yeah. didn't put anything in there. Perfect. So very important. So looking at at, uh, at the the execution, like uh, Shane was saying, first we have this timeline. That's when it fails, it takes me here, and it shows me that okay for each each image that that it was looking for, it shows you where it found that image, what was on the desktop at that time, and then when where it clicked. Once it found it, where it clicked, and then it typed here automate. You see that this one entered. The, the company name. And here it tells you we have two or three versions of this image of this button. It shows you which one it found, where it found it again. And this can be very useful to know where it clicked. For instance, if it found the button here and it clicked a little bit above it for whatever reason, uh, you know that you have to adjust your click and things like that. That can be very helpful. Now, when it came here, it didn't find this image. And it shows us where it was looking for it, which is the active window. We added that functionality to so make it more efficient and and not looking if the background, for instance, changed and stuff like that. It's not going to look at, uh, at anything in the background. Now, what is what's happening here? It's obviously it had it took this variation, and I think I think I was looking at this button or this one, one one of the two. But I can go in here, so to to address that that issue. So I go here. This is this is it shows me like this is what what it was looking for this is what was on the desktop when i play here it's the same problem it's not it's not going to find it but i have multiple functions here i can have it suggest to me what the tolerance that it would work is i can try to do it in black and white and see if it's going to work and of course if i have multiple failures on the same step I can correct and make sure that it works for all those failures or simply just take another version of the same image. This is what it is here. Uh, and I can adjust the size. I can retake that version actually of the image instead of doing that. I'm just going to go here and take a smaller one. Sometimes it's just a matter of taking it, taking a smaller image and not taking anything. Uh, see here, maybe that's the, what the problem is. Now when I play it here, it will it will find it. It will even tell me where exactly it found that image, and then I can accept these changes. These changes, and now my scripts has changed. Now, one of the things that Shane was talking about before, this is the failure screenshot they would see. It tells you this is what I was looking for. This is the script I was running at the step 53. This is what happened, and of course, this can be configurable. The the message you can you can put it in different languages and stuff so that you understand what's going on. So. Not to take too much of a time, I want to show you, after this is done, you send it to, to the controller. I have a script that I sent before to the controller, and I want to show you a load test quickly, and then I want to leave time for uh, uh, for Q&A. Yeah. So quickly, I'll go a pretty, fast, a pretty quick here. Yeah, let's show the controller. I think that's important to see that distinction. We had we had a couple questions coming on load testing, so it'd be Perfect. Cool I had it open before. Where is it? Uh, how, um, no, I, I had this open. I don't want to reopen it again. It's already there. Okay, so here's the controller. It's a web application. Oh, sorry. So let's just, yeah, I, I took it. So it's on a local host. This is all on the same machine. It's just an Azure machine, it not. Uh, so this is a web application that can be in your intranet. This, so far, the, the our performance testing is not a SaaS solution. You have you have to implement it in house or on on uh, your cloud account or or uh, or we can run with our partners uh, with, with choice solutions run tests for you and and help you create a script or you can do them yourself. Uh, you see here I can I will start a, a test quickly here just uh, this one that goes to Citrix and uh, to Salesforce. So you can give it a name and and a description and now. If you have multiple servers uh, as injectors, the controller will manage all of them for you. You don't have to go and it will start the users. I can I can go here 
and show you what's happening. So it's now distributing load and telling each one of the, your users what to run, what scripts run. You start seeing the application opening on each one of them. And you see, I think it's about 10 seconds delay. And I can show you, the, and you just see them running one by one and what's, what's happening in, in all of them. So if you go and see what this test is about, and we can look at all the ones. So you see two of them are running. That's what we saw. If we look at it here, you can give a name, number of users, and and what what the script they're going to run. You can have different scripts. How you want to ramp up your users added to the system, little by little. We're just starting five, the first five every five seconds, and then every 15 seconds, and then every 30 seconds. And if it has a CSV file, it will show you that we have a CSV. Obviously, we're not creating leads to the same ones. CSV. How you want to access that CSV? Is it sequentially? randomly or one of the, or unique which means if you use it once you cannot use it again and if you have any rendezvous points it will show you that as well and then you can you can send your test and you see how, this is how it's going to be for ramp up time is going to be two minutes and then the test will run for five minutes and then it starts ramping down yeah why I not have, run it, sam i guess we could yeah. uh maybe oz and i can just add a little color too with some use cases like why well, just kind of leave that yeah, screen up with the test running i guess and we can just talk for a second here but, uh, I was yeah, going to show the report, but go ahead. Oh, yeah. perfect. No, no, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. We'll, yeah, do the report first, and then we'll, yeah. Well, this is just the the when the test is done. Of course, as it's running, you can see what's going on. You can see the failures. But as when it's done, you have a recap detail report that tells you what the test is about, what scripts it, it were within the the test that they were run, and then how many iterations, how many users used those scripts, and if there's any CSV files like we were talking about, and then you will see that the results of the test when the ramp of time, how many the successes and failures, duration of the test, and then you start seeing the graphs and more statistical data like uh, the the minimum response time, the average for each script, each each transaction within the script, the 90th percentile, how many successes and, and failures. And then you, you would actually summarize everything by failures you see here the medical applications for instance failed 530 times and it, it's not going to show all the 530 screenshots which you can see in the controller if you want to see for every single one of them but here it shows you the last screenshot that usually tells you for that step so for the the step here the step number nine and they might all be the same they might be different sometimes they, they are different but this gives you an idea on what's happening and which steps you have more in most issues with so this is sometimes you, you see sql statements errors because the application is overwhelmed sometimes it's just uh, the citrix errors or the application is not displaying correctly and that's actually very powerful because if the application is heavily used from Citrix standpoint, maybe it's not displaying correctly or uh, or there are issues directly with the application like here, HDX. And I'm gonna hand it to you because I can talk forever about this stuff. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. That's a, thank you for, for running through that. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I'll, I'll talk through one real quick and then Oz, if you wanna jump in on, on one of the last uh, hospitals that we worked with. But I um, mean, you know, I recently worked, uh, with, we had a call center that we were doing and, and we basically were able to test with, with Cisco Jabber uh, it was almost a thousand user load tests. We were, we were able to actually simulate, as he showed those different tests, we actually simulated logging into the desktop, logging into Jabber, uh, authenticating to Jabber, uh, and then waiting for the phone call to come in, answer the phone call, and then basically do different iterations of that test so we can actually simulate agents answering calls. Um, and then they were doing a, another load test on their side, basically sending in automated calls and we were picking them up. So we were able to actually test, we were able to test a different, because of the different intervals, we're able to test kind of log in storms, log off storms, kind of find the best, uh, you know, the best sizing that we needed to do, you know, for the environment. Actually helped us find some issues uh, from a scalability standpoint. We had uh, with FS Logics and one of the file shares, for instance. And so those are the things you start seeing. It starts bringing these issues to surface when you conduct these load tests. So I thought that was kind of a cool use case um, that we uh, that we used it for just very recently. And I guess Oz, if you want to hop in there for a second and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, the the importance of these end, what I call the end-to-end -end load testing, right? Not just getting to the front door of the application and saying, yeah, your launch time or your login time was good or whatever. But specifically here, you know, our first uh, kind of partnership and project together, we've talked about a few times, Sam, is it was healthcare, right? As a hospital scenario where we had to specifically test the EMR, right? It wasn't good enough just to open it up. 
because in my case, uh, you got nice reporting and all the slick stuff that Sam just showed you here. But in my case, I had to load test. I had completely built from from scratch a whole new environment for Epic Hyperspace. I had to show that not only was the stats within Prism and everything look good and whatnot, but if you're familiar with Epic in, in the healthcare situation, they have what they call pulse data, right? So I had to cross-reference our data or our our uh, our stats and our sessions and how it was ramping up. I had to cross-reference that with Pulse, right? So in Pulse, you have latency. That's how Epic judges every every hospital customer, right? You got latency between clicks, exception errors, all that stuff. All of that is is logged from an Epic hyperspace scenario and their Pulse. So we had to go back to those reports after we ran our multiple multiple tests and cross-reference say, yep, this looked good during that those tests that we ran. And now we got the thumbs up to do a cutover later on, right? So that full end-to-end -end was the only thing that was possible for me to do what the customer wanted in, in that scenario. Now, the other part of that real quick, you'll get real good at revising your scripts, the scenarios, right? So I work closely with Sam's team got a great team back behind there, you know, behind the scenes. You get really good at adjusting the latency, like, oh, maybe five seconds wasn't enough to wait because we're getting a lot of failures on that step, or 10 seconds wasn't enough to wait, oh, or this thing. Yeah. So you get really good, and, and Sam showed how easy it was to adjust the scenarios because you have to do quite a bit of that till you get it to a point where you're like, there's always going to be an accepted uh, accepted amount of errors, so like a very small percent of errors that are legit as you're going through tests. You're never going to have, uh, you rarely have zero. Right. You'll have yeah. probably a few errors, you know, when you're running hundreds, if not thousands of sessions. Uh, so you get really good at adjusting that. Also, it helps you size your injectors, as they call it, from Sam's side. The injectors are the ones that are throwing those sessions at your infrastructure. You have to size those appropriately. In my case, I had to ramp those up too because our our failures started going through the roof because we didn't have enough injectors, for example, right? So you see all of that. And yeah, that was my scenario there. And what was, can you uh, tell us about your your projects and what was the feedback from Epic and the number of the, 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 the success of your project? Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, and that project went without a, with a without a hiccup, right? So a mul multitude of, of cutovers for various different components, but the hyperspace side in general for, you know, it's a, a active, active data center, you know, thousands and thousands of users uh, net new everything, including image. If you've ever built a hyperspace image from the, the ground up, uh, everything went without a hitch. And the only way we were able to feel good about it was running uh, Sam's test and, and going all the way through it again and being able to say epic basically we had a me weekly meeting with epic and they had to say yep the pulse data looks good you guys are good for cutover right so they had to tell us the data looked good because they logged the data and the data comes in after the fact and and they had to basically say yeah after you ran that last test uh things are good here so we're good with the cutover right so they're very happy on that Okay, thank you. There's one question uh, that I see here about does it work with the with 1912? So yes. Okay. Go ahead. Well, yeah, no, no, go, two points yeah. to that question, right? One is for automate, and then one is I think I believe that is in reference to the session recording pause and resume. So if if it is in reference to the pause and resume, that feature was only added in in uh, 2012, and, and session recording is a current release uh, product, anyways. So that might have just been in reference uh, to you, Sam. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Oh, case. there's another question, and I think it, they are they're both the same. For I'll give answer to both of them about does it work with thick client? So the the nature of the robotic side of this, it doesn't really matter if it is a thick client web application or or Citrix. It doesn't matter what version of Citrix or Java, because it's all visual. So we know that it works with all, with all versions of Citrix and future versions as well, because it, we're not looking at what's happening in the backend. Even if they change their protocol tomorrow or anything that that's added to to the application, it doesn't really matter because it's all visual. And the robot looks at it from from the front end. So it's uh, it, it should work with the, with all your applications as long as long as that application is accessible from a windows desktop we can we can run load tests on uh, uh, any tests actually any automation 
uh, for for that application. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. And uh, another question in here, you know, how easy is it to maintain the scripts? And you know, what if an application function and the app changes, like maybe a SaaS app like Salesforce, if they change not necessarily images, but maybe they change, you know, location or how the app works? Um, you know, do you have to redo the whole script from the start? Well, it depends on the change. It depends. So if that's just some images that, that changed, we can uh, retake those images easily. Then the, and you can add different variations of the same image and there's no limit to how many variations you add in there. And actually the bot has computer vision in there and we add in one more AI to, to our robot so that they can take those images by themselves and, and decide what to do when, when to take new images. But if the whole flow has changed or if there's new functionality, you just go and zoom in on that area where the change happened and you can re-record that area or, or add new functionality to it. You don't have to redo the whole, the whole process. And yeah. we also add in there like I was saying before, we, 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 our concern is always to make sure to minimize the maintenance of those scripts because especially with the functional testing, we have customers that have over a thousand scripts. So, the, the, and the application might, the whole application might, might change, that might change the look and feel and the font and all that stuff. And, but we have ways, so to minimize that changes where uh, all the menus and the, and the icons and the buttons will be in, in specific scripts that you call and execute just one button from, from that script. Those are the snippets, right? The snippets that you talked the about? The snippet, no, I'm, I'm talking about script section where you call a script oh, right. and you just okay. execute a, a specific section in the script. The snippets is a different thing where, for instance, uh, we're working with SAP where all the fields you have to to find the label, then then uh, then the field is drop down. You have to click on drop down, open, type the type the text, and then still after you type the value, the drop down opens, and then you select it. So it's always the same thing. So you can create a snippet for that. Uh, the snippet is just a, a portion of the script that you pass variables to it. Like you can pass with an image and a text, and you're gonna execute no matter what the field is. You execute the same thing for it, and that makes it a very very simple and very agile for all the fields and stuff, for all this okay. type of yeah, and then, uh, yeah. We just got, we got to wrap up, I guess we're already, time flies yes. and you're having fun, right? So yeah. uh, there was, there's one question just around uh, comparing to login VSI. I think the biggest thing, and you can add in just for a second and we'll wrap up, but uh, to me and, and, and to Oz, I think the biggest thing uh, for us as, as we looked at it, as we're kind of comparing platforms, is really around the custom workflow piece and the simplicity to be able to make your own scripts. That was, that was what, you know, a lot of our customers were asking for versus kind of standard knowledge, power, uh, you know, workers, right, or task-based workers. They really wanted to test real workflows. That makes it really uh, simple with the with the scenario builder, um, and and obviously, you know, the the cost. It was really just significantly. I was going to say uh, that. Yeah. 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 Also, Less you know, well in our case, we were we were only we we only had to license it for like a piece of the environment. Maybe you don't need the whole environment, right? So that's that's key with yeah. Sam's product. And yeah. even a duration of the licensing as well, so we can uh, we can have short durations as well. Cool. Yep. All right. I, I, yeah. I have nothing so, to add. So with that, yeah, with that said, uh, you know, I just want to thank uh, thank everyone for coming out and, and kind of hanging out with us to learn more about Choice Solutions, about Automa, about our partnership, how we work together uh, to bring some of these solutions, uh, you know, to our customers as well as you know new customers out there. And we're we look forward to uh, to working with you. And yeah, thank you, Oz. Any final words? No, oh, man. Just uh, good job. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys Thank you, for Sam. putting really this together. <laughs> Same yeah. here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Looking for looking forward to the next one. Yeah, we'll talk to you all soon on the Orlando Jacksonville C U G C oh, that Shane and I are yeah. presenting on. Props uh, right. we gotta we gotta prop luck. that up. We'll be there. February eleventh. Yes. So. Yeah, so yeah, February eleventh. I think it's three Eastern. We're talking about unified communications and a lot of tips and tricks uh, for for managing yep. all that inside of Citrix and optimizing it. So check it out. Excellent. All right, we will. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.